hanging around till the end of the workshop this week. It's been a very enjoyable experience. I, I hope you've enjoyed the talks. I know that I've enjoyed and got something out of the other talks, and uh, I hope you, you did too. Um, as the last speaker, I'd really like to put out a special thanks to the organizers for all their good work that they've done and all the help that they've had here at KIAS to make it such a pleasant and hospitable experience to be here for the week. I, th I think I, I'm sure I speak for both Walter and Craig that it's been a, a really sort of excellent week for us here and we've enjoyed it immensely. So um, in particular, I'd like to thank Professor Su Young Choi for his wonderful hospitality and, you know, buying us beer in the evenings. So that's, uh, that's always a very pleasant thing. So let's, let's thank the organizer for such a great day. No, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to thank him. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'd like to talk about today goes back to the first lecture that I talked about. So I'd like to talk about sort of the abundance of involutions. And how that can be sh as we'll see, can be used in a very interesting way to characterize arithmeticity that also has kind of powerful implications for the geometry and topology of finite sheeted covering spaces of arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds that are in the context of some open questions that I'll talk about later. So if you recall, you know, what does this mean? So if you recall in the context of the modular group PSL2Z, in the first lecture we exhibited lots of elements of order 2 orientation preserving involutions that weren't visible as a subgroup of the modular group, but they existed to normalize certain interesting congruent subgroups of the modular group that we constructed um, just basically directly. So the first thing I'd like to talk about today is showing you that that's very much a feature of arithmeticity. So um, to begin with, um, so let's consider the following. So let's let A and B be elements of PSL2C. And throughout today's lecture, almost exclusively, I'm going to blur the distinction between SL2 and PSL2 and almost always think about things living in SL2C today. So let's let A and B be elements of SL2C, uh, which are uh, hyperbolic and they don't commute. So, in terms of the action on H3, as we've seen several times this week, there is a, an axis, a geodesic, that's left invariant by A, and a geodesic that's left invariant by B, the axis of B. And let's just assume that these axes are, are disjoint. So let's assume that the axis of A So this is, um, these are the axes. So the picture that we have in H3 is, well, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the, this, this axis, maybe this is the axis of A, and then maybe here, here is the axis of B. Now, it was a very beautiful observation uh, due to Trolls Jorgensen that there is an involution that exists that um, sends the fixed points of A back to themselves. So it sends this guy at infinity to zero and zero up to infinity and switches these two fixed points here. So that involution is, arises by looking at the common perpendicular between these two geodesics in H3. So this is meant to be perpendicular. So, so Jorgensen observed that there exists an involution. So this is going to be an orientation preserving isometry. Um, it'll have fixed points. Let's just call it tau AB uh, such that tau AB conjugating 
A sends A to its inverse, so the rotation, so tau is going to rotate around here and does the flipping of the fixed points that I just mentioned. And tau AB, B, tau AB inverse is B inverse. So this involution was constructed by just uh, thinking about taking the, the Lie product AB minus BA, this defines some element inside GL2C, so it has trace which is zero, but its determinant is not zero, so you can form an element in, in GL2C, so this can be projected to be in PGL2C, which is isomorphic, of course, to PSL2C, defining our element of order two, and, <clears throat> and so here it is. And the key observation now is, therefore, that if we take the group generated by AB, so if we have F equals a group generated by A and B, then tau normalizes F, i.e. tau F tau inverse is equal to F, since A to A inverse, B to B inverse, and so we're in good shape. Now, this doesn't use anything much at all here. It just it's kind of a very general construction inside SL2C. So now let's assume we're in the context of um, co-compact, let's just say, Kleinian groups. I'm gonna, so now assume that, that F is contained in gamma and gamma is co-compact. One can do a similar argument as to what I'm about to do for finite co-volume things, but um, let's just stick with co-compact just in case I've got to say some other words that I forget to say. So assume we've got this guy F inside gamma. So here, here's gamma, and here, and here is F. So F is this little two-generator subgroup. Now, if we're in the context, say, of some manifold here, so gamma is the fundamental group of a hyperbolic three-manifold, then, then typically this F is just going to be a free subgroup of rank two. We've assumed that it's non-commuting, so it's going to be, can't be Z cross Z, and, well, the only other possibility for three manifolds is that, in fact, it would have finite index in gamma. But, you know, if you just choose some random F, it's going to be some very deep free subgroup inside this group gamma. Now, we've seen that tau normalizes F. And it's just inconceivable, you would think, that tau normalizes gamma, or indeed tau normalizes anything to do with gamma, i.e. something commensurable with gamma. But the beautiful thing that I'll hopefully convince you of, and this is you know, something that you should tell all your friends later, is that you know, in the context of arithmetic things, tau can be promoted to live in an arithmetic Kleinian group. So let's assume now, assume further, that gamma is arithmetic. And then the proposition that, that we'll discuss the proof of is that um, tau AB, which probably I'll just shorthand to tau for now, uh, belongs to a group delta, and delta is commensurable with gamma. I.e., tau can be promoted from something that's a very deep infinite index subgroup that you know you think has nothing to do with anything, but to do with symmetries of a hyperbolic manifold to actually have something to do with symmetries. Namely, it's going to be contained in some lattice commensurable with the one you started with. So this is a very powerful statement. So this is one indication of what abundance means, and, and you'll see a sharper interpretation of what abundance means once we dig in to see the structure of the proof of this. So let's talk about how one proves this. So again, as is often convenient, um, Walter and myself and Craig, we like to work with you know, this group gamma 2. So somehow that carries the, the right information. And so notice here that if you square the elements A and B, well, you know, that has the same axis, and that has the same axis, so, you know, you still have the same common perpendicular, so you may as well work with the squares rather than just um, A and B. So, let's assume, let, let us assume, uh, for convenience, 
that again, you know, gamma is just, we'll just take gamma equal to the group generated by squares. So what are we going to do? So the proof, so this is going to follow from the following claim. So, so the proof will follow. from the following. So claim one. Is let's let O be equal to the following. So before I write this down, so, so remember here secretly we're thinking now of gamma. So gamma's thought of as, as a subgroup of SL2C. We've got this arithmetic guy, and again, as we kind of been discussing, there's this machine out over here somewhere that gives you arithmetic lattices. And another way to think about that is in terms of the invariant data associated to a discrete subgroup of SL2 or PSL2C. So we're thinking of A gamma kind of living inside M2C. So B is going to be A gamma. And um, K is K gamma. So let's let, let us consider script O is going to be combinations 1A, B, and AB. So this is the ring of integers of K again as usual. And so we're going to take RK combinations of these elements A, B, and AB. And so the claim one is that O is an order. Of B. And then claim two is that Tor normalizes O. i.e. tau O, tau inverse is equal to O. So again, we're thinking of, thinking of O sitting inside M2C here. Now, given these two claims, this will construct our lattice delta. So, so given these claims, um, this constructs a delta with tall contained in delta. Why is that? Well, the key phrase is that normalizers of orders are themselves arithmetic lattices commensurable with what you started with. So let's let L be equal to an order of B, and we'll define the normalizer of L to be those X and B invertibles such that x, l, x inverse is equal to l. So this is the normalizer of the order. <coughs> then when we project this into PSL2C or PGL2C, since we're in B star, but again, PGL is isomorphic to PSL2 here then this is a lattice. So P of this guy here is commensurable with gamma. And again, the reason for this is that, that notice that if alpha belongs to O1 and X belongs to the normalizer, sorry, that's L, belongs to L1, so the, the elements of norm 1 in this order, and X belongs to the normalizer of L, well, what happens to X alpha X inverse? Well, that's inside O, of course, sorry, I keep saying that. It's inside L because X is in the normalizer of the order, so it, it takes L back to something in L. And moreover, what is the norm of this? The norm of x alpha x inverse, well, that's just equal to the norm of alpha when we do the multiplication, and that's equal to 1. So, in fact, this implies that x um, belongs to the normalizer of the unit group of this. So, when we project this down, L1, we've seen, is part of the machine that gives arithmetic groups. Normalizers of discrete groups are discrete, and so we get a lattice for this. This then contains that, and therefore that's also a lattice. Okay, so let's go back to here. <coughs> so 
so since um, so so since so again we're kind of looking p l one looks like um, gamma l one the notation that I had before and the normalizer and p of the normalizer of l one is therefore discrete is discrete go compact and this implies that This guy is discrete. So we get a normalizer of a discrete group that we're discrete. So delta is really just this guy here. So this is the magic. So this is the power here that we're using, that somehow from a very arbitrary deep subgroup of, of gamma, we produce some arithmetic object that can see the symmetries, and therefore we can construct a lattice that contains the element of order 2. So now let's talk a little bit about how one proves these two claims. And we've talked a little bit about orders thus far, but we haven't really said so much about it. So let's just do some order computations just for the, for the sake of it. So maybe I'll do a little digression over here. So before I start talking about <coughs> the proof of claims one and two, So it's just a little digression. So there are various ways that one can define an order. And a convenient way to define it here is simply to think of an order O in B is equal to a, a ring of, of integers. And I'll define what this is in a minute in B that contains RK and a K basis for the algebra. Okay, so that's one way of describing what an order is. And so what's an integer? Well, remember in Professor Choi's talk, we have the, the involution on B that sends X to X bar. And then we have the reduced trace on B, which is then equal to x plus x bar, and the reduced norm on B, which is x times x bar. And something is an integer when these both lie inside the ring of integers. So x is an integer of the algebra when the norm k to b, sorry, k to b, b to k of x and the trace from b belongs to rk. Now again, as was mentioned in Professor Choi's talk, I mean, unlike the case where we're in the number field, um, integers don't form naturally a, a subring of the, of the algebra i.e. that it's not closed under addition or multiplication. So here's an exercise just to, just to do, or you can ask me later to do it, I guess. It's, the exercise is that um, if we take b to be just minus 1, 3, q, the Hilbert symbol given us so, and alpha to be equal to j, and beta to be equal to 3j plus 4ij over 5, then these are integers. But um, alpha plus beta and alpha beta are not integers. So I mean, it's clear that you know the trace of these guys is zero. When the norm of this is that's an integer, but this this norm one can check isn't, and then one has to. So this norm is, <laughs> and these ones aren't. So that's the that's the exercise to do. OK, so <clears throat> the only reason for mentioning this is that you know, we're going to prove that something's an order here, and we're going to consider this particular way of thinking of an order. So the order that we're, well, the thing that we're trying to show is an order is these RK combinations of AB and AB. So let's 
look at the proof of claim one. So the first thing is a K basis for the algebra. Now, A and B are known commuting hyperbolic elements. And in fact, elementary linear algebra tells you that this, in fact, is a basis for the 2 by 2 matrices over the complex numbers, never mind for B. So note um, 1, A, B, and A, B are are linearly independent over the complex numbers. That's using the fact that it's known that these guys generate a non-elementary subgroup of SL2C. Now, the good thing here is we've got RK combinations of, the, of these guys. So just taking sums of these guys, OK, so you know, trace of A and the trace of B and the trace of AB, they're, they're all elements in gamma, so they're all integral in this sense because they're in this arithmetic group. And when we take um, norms, of course, that's determinant, so these are debt one, so these are all integers. And when we take RK combinations of that, they're also just integers because we're just, just taking linear combinations. So the key thing is to really understand products of these basis elements. That's the key to proving that this is an order. So we need to show... basis elements are in, in this set, O. So how do we do that? Well, this is where we appeal to the nice properties that we have for matrices inside SL2C. So when we're inside SL2C, we've got very nice trace identities. So let's just recall if if x belongs to SL2C, then x plus its inverse is equal to the trace of x times the identity. So in particular, if we took, for instance, x to be an element of O1 now, so if x is now an element of O1, then um, x plus x inverse so that's inside SL2C equals trace x times the identity. And of course, that implies that the inverse belongs to O, because the inverse then is just written as a sum of things that we already have, namely the basis elements. So that tells us right away that you know, A inverse, B inverse, and the inverse of AB are all elements of the order. So this implies that A inverse, B inverse, and A, B inverse belong to O. Now then, we start multiplying things together. So if we take A times itself, for instance, so now consider, I'll just do some examples here. So if we consider A times A, which is A squared, well, how do we write that as a sum of basis elements? Well, we've got this identity. So let's look at A plus A inverse equals trace of A times the identity. If we multiply both sides by A, so this implies that A squared plus the identity is equal to trace of A times A. And then rearranging that, again, tells us that A squared belongs to, well, A squared is an O. It's a sum of the, it's a sum of the basis elements. So that tells us the same thing we can do for b squared and ab squared. OK, well, this is, this is just great fun. So let's continue onwards. So let's think about multiplying a times ab. Now, of course, we can multiply a times ab on the left, or we could multiply a times ab on the right, since we're non-commutative here. So what about, let's consider a times ab. So that's a squared b. Well, of course, we now have a squared, and so we can just multiply by b here again, and we see that from above, we have um, a squared plus i is equal to trace of a times a, and therefore a squared times b plus b equals trace of a times 
AB. And so therefore, A squared B looks like trace of A, AB minus B. So that's a combination of the basis elements once again. Now what about multiplying on the other side if we took AB times A this time? Well, how can we get that as a combination of basis elements? Well, um, well we have AB plus, um, let's just see, what B inverse A inverse. So this is equal to AB inverse is equal to the trace of AB. Okay, so that's the standard little trace identity there. Now if we multiply on the right by on the right by A again, we get that ABA plus multiplying here, we get B inverse equals trace of AB times A. And again, we've already seen that B inverse is a sum of terms, and so therefore ABA can be expressed as a sum of terms. So this implies that ABA is a sum of basis elements. And one can continue on in this way. And so leave, let me just leave this in a little exercise. I don't want to bore you with details. Let's try and, if, try and do B times A as a sum of the basis elements. So we can talk about that later. If, well, but anyway, so what we've just seen now is therefore that using the trace identities, we can write all the products of the basis elements as a sum of the basis elements. And therefore, we get that indeed O is an order. So that proves claim one. Now, what about Tor normalizing O? Well, what does Tor do to the, the basis elements? So, for claim two, so we know that, well, Tor doesn't do anything to the identity. But tor A, Tor inverse, that's A inverse. Well, that's an O. We just saw that above there. Tor B, Tor inverse. That's B inverse. That's an O from above. And tau A, B, tau inverse. Well, that's A inverse times B inverse. Well, and of course, that is B A inverse. And that's an, that's an O. So the inverse from above again is an O. So that, that's also an O. So tau preserves these guys. And so therefore, tau belongs to the normalizer of this order. OK, so very elementary algebraic calculations using the trace identities gives us that this collection generated over the ring of integers is an order. So this is a very cool thing, actually. It comes up all over the place when one studies arithmetic Kleinian groups. One constructs orders out of subgroups, and it gives you useful information. OK, so um, we've just proven, therefore, the proposition that, um, that uh, this involution that's living in a very deep subgroup can be promoted to live in a subgroup that's commensurable with the group gamma. OK. But we want to go a little bit further than that. So this is so going further. So let's go back to this picture here. So we've now proven that um, we've got this involution tau about this common perpendicular between these two geodesics. And it gives us some involution that belongs to this group delta. And delta is commensurable with gamma. So let me just record this over here again. So we have tau and delta and delta. It's commensurable with gamma. Now, since we're in a co-compact Kleinian group, we've got this elliptic element of order 2 here. But in fact, since we're in a co-compact group, there's also, there's also a hyperbolic element inside the group delta that shares this axis with tau. So since delta is co-compact, there exists a hyperbolic element in delta, let's call them W, 
such that um, W has the same axis as tall. Now then, gamma and delta are commensurable, so by powering W up, we get an element that's hyperbolic that lives inside gamma. Gamma, delta, commensurable. Yeah, so, I mean, we're in a co-compact group, right? So we've got this delta, right? And so we can pass to some regular finite cover of, delta, of the quotient orbifold for which tau is then normalizing. And then the fixed point set is a one-dimensional submanifold that has to be totally geodesic because it's a fixed point set of an isometry. And so therefore, you've got a loop in that manifold that's therefore carrying a, a hyperbolic element. So gamma and delta commensurable means that there exists a delta which is equal to W to the N, say, that lives inside gamma. So this is the axis of some element delta now that's a hyperbolic element. So now what do we do? Well, we can translate this whole picture using the element A. So now let's translate. Um, so now use A to translate Let's call this let's call this G desic something. Well, let's say delta. That's good. Translate a delta. So now we've got a translate of this guy. So let's see if I can even draw the picture. So it looks maybe something like this. So this is A applied to A delta. So we've taken this common perpendicular here, translated by this axis there. And now what do we have? Well, there's a hyperbolic element here in gamma, and there's a hyperbolic element here in gamma. So we just run the previous argument, and what we see is that associated to this axis, we can now construct an involution tall prime in exactly the same way as we had before. So now, we can repeat the previous argument with um, the order RK1 delta A delta inverse and the product delta A delta A inverse. Okay, so that's the red guy and the blue guy, and then this is the common perpendicular here, and so we get a tall prime that normalizes that. And this produces a tall prime with the same axis as one of the original guys that we started with. So what have I just done for you here? The conclusion is that you give me any axis of a hyperbolic element, in an arithmetic Kleinian group, then I can find an involution that shares that axis. So that's meant to be abundance, that you know, we've got all these closed geodesics in this arithmetic hyperbolic manifold, they're all axes of involutions somewhere. So we conclude from this. So the conclusion, and this is what, you know, you maybe want to tell your friends or speak to your parents later and tell them that, you know, this is kind of a really cool thing, that, um, that every, axis of a hyperbolic element is uh, the axis of an involution. Okay, so the involution is going to live in some mysterious group that we don't know much about, but that's kind of some of the power of the arithmeticity again. There's this beautiful picture of this G to S6 and H3, and there are all these involutions sort of going around these axes. And this is getting very close to um, characterizing what it means to be arithmetic. And in fact, let me state a slightly sexier version than what I've just written here as what it means to be arithmetic. So, you know, 
you know, when I was younger, trying to understand Thurston's notes, it was just incomprehensible for me. And, but, you know, I, the moral was that somehow we should try to think geometrically and, you know, what does an arithmetic manifold mean geometrically? That's something that, you know, seemed like an interesting thing to do. So what I'm going to write down now is perhaps the characterization, or well, there's several characterizations of what it means to be arithmetic, but this is one that's in terms of a language that if you're a, a low-dimensional geometer, then you understand what we're about to say. So, so characterizing arithmeticity. So let's let M be equal to H3 mod gamma be a closed. Again, there's a version for this for a finite volume, but anyway, let's just stick with this. Closed. Hyperbolic three manifold. Then M is arithmetic. If and only if the following condition holds. So let me draw the picture and uh, we can talk about it here. So, so here is M, and then you give me any closed G desic in M. So here. So there's a closed G desic in M. And the condition is then that there should be a finite sheeted covering space. So this is a finite sheeted cover, M sub G of M, such that um, M sub G admits an orientation preserving involution. So there's an involution tau, which is orientation preserving with the property that uh, its fixed point set contains a component of the preimage of G. So that fixed point set of tau contains a component of the of the preimage of G. Okay. So that's the picture. So there may be lots of components, but I just get it fixes fixes one of them. And you'll see Hopefully you'll see the connection by what I've written down here. I mean, everything is in terms of lifting to the universal cover and getting axes associated to hyperbolic elements that project down to give you this guy here. So let me just you know, say a few more words here about just finishing this proof off. So we let gamma belong to gamma be hyperbolic whose axis projects to G. And again, since I'm just thinking about axis, I'll also just pass to the usual business of looking at the group gamma 2, and I'll just suppress that. So now what we've just seen from above so from above, there exists a tor that's in some group delta commensurable with gamma, such that, well, from this conclusion here, the axis of gamma is the same as the axis of tor. It's a tor and delta commensurable to gamma, an involution. axis of tau equal to the, the axis of gamma. And now we're, we're, we're done. So here is gamma, here is delta, here is the intersection gamma with delta. So this is finite index subgroup. This is a finite index subgroup. Tau is in here. We want something that admits a symmetry. How do we do that? Well, we pass the normal subgroups, and we do that here. So now we take 
you know, the core in delta of gamma intersect delta. So the core just means the intersections of all conjugates of gamma intersect delta inside delta. So then tau normalizes this. This is a manifold because it's inside gamma. Well, the quotient's a manifold because it's inside gamma, and tau normalizes it. So tau normalizes this, let's just call this group C, and we take M sub G to be H3 modulo C. So that's the group that projects to give us this guy, and by construction, we've got this geodesic in the manifold now that's left invariant by tau. So that's proving that arithmeticity gives you the, the involutions. You may wonder, well, why is it just arithmetic things? I'm not going to say too much about that. And here I'm going to cheat. So going back the way, this is really using Margulis. And I'm not going to say too much more. Margulis says that if you're non-arithmetic, there's a unique maximal group in the commensurability class. So you've got two groups that are commensurable. They're all down below this given subgroup. And basically, you just can't have all these involutions associated with the geodesic living in a single discrete group. So again, you should think of the picture that we said right at the start of the lectures where we constructed these involutions that normalize subgroups of the modular group, and they could not live in the same discrete group. And that's kind of the reason that we have here as well. They can't live in the, the same discrete group. So this is a cheat because it uses some heavy, heavy lifting, but this is kind of elementary in some sense. Okay. So that's really the, one of the key things that I'd like to try to get over that somehow, this is a description of the abundance of symmetries on finite sheeted covers of arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds. We have all these involutions that are coming to us, and then somehow that can be translated into a kind of clean statement about symmetries on covering spaces. Now, in fact, one can go a little bit further, and I'll do that just because, yeah. Yeah, and gamma? Well, so it's finite index here, remember. So we're taking, this is finite index here. So to get a normal subgroup of finite index, you just intersect all the conjugates of this guy and that guy. So that's finite index there. And so that's finite index in there. And so everything is OK. It's not normal. But we have this manifold that admits this involution. So there's extra information. So we've constructed this involution tau and this involution tau prime. And it's easy to see that these two involutions commute. So in fact, the tau and the tau prime generate a Klein 4 group. So note that tau and tau prime commute. So this implies that you know, um, the group V, which is generated by tau and tau prime, so that's order two, that's order two, and the product is order two, that's just what this is saying, is isomorphic to just um, Z2 cross Z2. Now then, the next thing to observe is that, in fact, this Klein four groups. So not only are we producing involutions that are in groups commensurable with what we started with, we're actually going to construct a Z2 cross Z2 inside a group commensurable with the one we started with. So V lives in an arithmetic Klein union group. And, and how, do we, how do we find this V again? Commensurable with gamma. Well, again, we construct an order. So we take um, the order O that's going to be generated by combinations of A, 
delta and A delta. Okay, so A is this axis that shares with tau prime. Delta is this axis. So this is, where are we going? Uh, that's, which, no, sorry. I've drawn a, yeah, right. That's it, that's right. It's over there. So A delta is the red axis here. And um, this is A. So if we take A and delta now, then both of these involutions normalize this order. So tau and tau prime belong to the normalizer of O because, well, what is, what is tau do to A? Well, tau was constructed to take A to A inverse, so that's okay. And then, well, what does tau prime do to A? Well, it commutes, so that's okay. So tau prime A, tau prime inverse is A. And similarly with delta, okay? If we take tau prime applied to delta, that takes delta to delta inverse, because that's the perpendicular bisector here. And then tau fixes that guy, so it commutes with delta. So therefore tau normalizes, and tau prime normalizes this order. And then that gives us a discrete group. So then we take, again, um, delta equal to um, P of the normalizer. OK. So we get the Klein 4 group now that lives inside some lattice commensurable with the one we started with. So let me just summarize this discussion the theorem that um, every arithmetic Kleinian group is commensurable with one with a, with a delta such that delta contains a Klein Ford group. Now, in fact, it, it's kind of saying much more than just one, of course. I mean, there's going to be lots of groups and lots of Klein Ford groups. Again, any time we have this configuration of axes, that's going to give us a Klein Ford group. And so really what this is, if one thinks about it for, as, w as was said in the previous talk, for an hour after my talk, then in fact what this really is is a, a geometric incarnation of the Hilbert symbol associated to the quaternion algebra. Okay, so let's just take a pause here. So, so far I've tried to convince you about the abundance of involutions and indeed the abundance of Klein 4 groups. Well, that's very nice and it's kind of clearly an interesting geometric feature. But in fact, you know, the next piece of the discussion I'd like to talk about is that really this is you know, somewhat more deeper than one might expect. So uh, what I now want to talk about is some of these open conjectures in three-manifold topology in the context of, of this. So these were briefly mentioned in, in Kang's talk, or one of his talks. So let's just talk about some three-manifold topology. So we've heard most of the words before. So, so again, here, you know, we're going to take a closed hyperbolic three manifold. And, and post Perlman, this might be viewed as the most interesting open questions or slash conjectures around with, to do with closed hyperbolic three manifolds. So let's let M is H3 mod gamma closed closed hyperbolic. So there, there is a slate of increasingly stronger conjectures and questions about the topology of finite sheeted covering spaces. So the first thing is, um, so these are, so let's just, let's just state these as conjectures. Let's be bold, it's Friday, so we can be bold. So um, the first thing is that M is virtually Hawking. So again, what does that mean? So here, here's our manifold M. Here's finite sheeted covering, N, and the property that N should have, as was described in Oshika's talk, is that it's going to be Haken. So there's going to be a map of a closed surface into N. So there's lots of silly maps that one can do this with. But what we want is that F is going to be an embedding. Well, there's still lots of embeddings that maybe aren't so interesting, but we want this to be one-to-one -one at the level of fundamental group. So 
F star and pi 1 sigma g to pi 1 n is 1 to 1. So the surfaces that we're going to look at here, because we're in the world of hyperbolic things, the genus is always at least 2. So g here is bigger than or equal to 2. So what we're asking for now is, given your m, the task is to find a finite sheeted covering space um, so that it contains this nice embedded so-called incompressible surface in the manifold. But I should say that it was recently proven by Kahn and Markovich that, well, if you notice, if you are a Harkin up here, you push that surface down, you'll get a surface subgroup of pi 1 of m. There'll be this immersed surface in this manifold here that will still be kind of incompressible. And Kahn and Markovich have re recently proven that, in fact, all closed hyperbolic three manifolds do contain these immersed incompressible surfaces. Okay, so two is that, well, there are two... There are two flavors now that we could have. So we've got this embedded surface in our manifold. Well, the surface could be embedded and separating the manifold into two pieces. Or um, it's non-separating. So that when you cut open the manifold along the surface, it, it's connected. Now, what's, what's good about this guy? So we've got this... Uh, embedded surface now that's a non-trivial class on H2 and we'll get this cycle here that will give us a non-trivial class on H1 so that here um, B1 is bigger than 0. So the conjecture that's somewhat stronger than this one is is that um, N, M has a finite sheeted cover with positive first Billy number. Okay, so we want to kind of arrange this picture in a finite sheeted covering space. Now, the strengthening of this is, well, now we've got positive first bitty number. Can we start trying to increase the first bitty number without bound by passing through towers of finite sheeted covering spaces? So the, the third thing is... So let's, let's make a definition first of all. So let's define the virtual first Betty number. So VB1 of M, this is going to be the soup over those, well, sorry, the, the first Betty number of X, where X to M is a finite sheeted covering space. So asking that the first Betty number be increased without bound through towers of finite index subgroups, what does that mean? It means that um, VB1 of M is infinity. So this is a conjecture. So this is conjecture three, that we can increase the first Betty number without bound. Now, you may think this is just um, perhaps not so interesting, but in fact, you know, getting from zero to one is hard. And interesting. And in fact, in the development of Thurston's hyperbolization theorem, getting from 1 to 2 would have been good. So had Thurston been able to get from first Betty number equal to 1 to first Betty number equal to 2 in a finite sheeted cover, he wouldn't have had to do Thurston norm and all his Pseudonosov stuff. Sorry, he would have to do the Thurston norm stuff, but he wouldn't have had to do the, the double limit theorem or Pseudonosov stuff because he could have hyperbolized this finite sheeted covering space using a surface that was not a fiber and a vibration over the circle that comes from the Thurston norm being a polygon that allows you to find these nice surfaces. So had he been able to get from 1 to 2, then um, perhaps he wouldn't have had the double limit theorem, or maybe he wouldn't have written it down at all. But um, anyway, it's still an open question, in fact, that for a bundle of rank 1, can you find a finite sheeted cover for which the homology has got rank at least 2? Okay, so that's the third one, and then perhaps the fourth conjecture in the slate of ever stronger conjectures is the following. Well, what's, what's your favorite group that you know has finite index subgroups for which the abelianization has rank that grows without bound? Well, free groups. So you pass to finite index subgroups of a free group, the rank of the homology of those subgroups grows along with the rank of the free group. So the fourth thing is that, um, is that gamma is large i.e. that um, you have gamma and there's a delta 
this is finite index, and then delta has to surject onto the free non abelian group of rank 2. So this is what large means. So there's this property here. So if we're large, we get these finite index subgroups in the free group for which the rank grows without bound. And so you can pull that back to, to delta and find towers of finite index <coughs> subgroups for which the rank of abelianization grows without bound. And so that's, that's what happens. So the discussion is meant to be that 4 implies 3, 3 implies 2, and 2 implies 1. That's a little bit of three manifold topology there. That if whenever your B1 is positive, you do get uh, an embedded incompressible surface. So that's the slate of open problems. And there's a fair amount of evidence these days that, you know, that, you know if I was a betting man, I would maybe bet, you know, 5,000 won. <laughs> that, you know, these things were true. Maybe, maybe in the bar later, I'll up it to 50,000. But let's be conservative. But, you know, there's a fair amount of evidence that these conjectures do hold. But there's still, I would say, you know, a fair ways to go before proving these kinds of things in generality. And what has been apparent over the last few years is that that manifolds that are commensurable with orbifolds seem better suited to attacking these kinds of questions. So let me say a little bit about that. So, manifolds commensurable with orbifolds seem more tractable. Now, what do I mean by that? So, let me do a little schematic of what I mean by that. So, over in this corner of the blackboard here is the world of close hyperbolic three manifolds. So this is a very hard and dark and fearsome world. You know, it's a bit like Scotland, really. So this is that box there. And then over here, and you know, this is a sort of happy, this is a happy place over here. So this is a world of cusped hyperbolic three manifolds of finite volume. So this is a happy place, you know because it's like, it's like California. It's a sunny, happy place. Now, why do I say that? Well, you see, if you're in the world of cusp hyperbolic manifolds, well, if you take the interior, then you get these compact three manifolds with toroidal boundary. Well, these are Harkin by definition, and they've got positive B1 by elementary three manifold topology because there's no empty boundary. And you can increase the rank of homology without bound by passage to finite sheeted covers just because you can take elementary covering spaces to do this. However, what one can prove is that, that these guys are large in a very strong way. So this is a result of Cooper and Long and myself. So Cooper, Long, and myself prove large. So cusp hyperbolic manifolds have fundamental groups that admit finite index subgroups that surject onto free non-abelian groups. And it's done in a very kind of explicit way. And, and how is it done? Well, it exploits the cusps. So, you know, that's the thing that you can get your hands on. The problem with a closed hyperbolic manifold is that there's nothing you can really kind of see that you might help to build topology. So, for instance, you know, there are already these nice embedded surfaces inside these hyperbolic manifolds with toroidal boundaries. Some of them are non-separating and some of them are separating, but there are lots of incompressible surfaces that one can begin to exploit. And so somehow what has seemed to have been kind of a philosophy is that the orbifolds seem to be this interpolating kind of example. And again, what does one mean by that in any sense? Well, orbifolds have singular locus. And somehow the idea would be that here we exploited the cusps to prove largeness, and one would try to now try to exploit the existence of singular locus to prove statements as well. So let me give you a, a selection of theorems that, that I'll, I won't say too much about the proof, but I think it's worth mentioning just 
in the context of the discussion. So there are several results that Mark Lackenby and myself and Darren Long have proven. So, so and this one connects directly to this statement here. So let's let gamma so let's let M the H3 mod gamma be a hyperbolic three manifold. with virtual first Betty number of M, so meaning that we can get to at least four in a finite sheeted cover. So we know we've got to four. So there's an assumption there. The first Betty number is at least four. Furthermore, we assume that we're commensurable with an orbifold that has got a Z2 cross Z2 subgroup. Assume that M or gamma, say, is commensurable with delta And delta contains Z2 cross Z2. So again, think about these examples. Then one gets large. So then gamma is large. So the discussion that we've just been talking about is very much now pertinent. That here's all these arithmetic groups. They've all got Z2 cross Z2s in their commensurability class. So when we get to B1 is at least 4, for arithmetic things, we will be large. So a corollary of this, if M is arithmetic, and VB1 of M is at least 4, this implies that pi 1 of M is large. So this is one of the reasons that we were interested in the results. So